Faith for Today with Colin Urquhart and Julia Fisher. We've been taking a close look at uh, two verses in Isaiah 9 this week, Colin. We've just been laughing that we've spent the whole week talking about two verses, but every word is so rich. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. Of course, this is all to do with the birth of Jesus. And we were seeing yesterday that... um, Jesus is the one who governs in his kingdom. Uh, As believers, we are part of his government, and therefore, or we are under his government, let me put it that way, but also we are part of his government. Uh, We'll come on to that a little later. But first of all, we have to let him rule and reign over us. We have to let him govern over us. He is Lord. He is king. He is the boss. Uh, he is the governor in our lives. That's that's the point. So we're not free agents just to do whatever we like and think that God will be tolerant about it. No, he has saved us and come to live within us by the power of his spirit in order that now we might live obedient lives in love for him, not legalistic obedience to some written code of instructions, but that out of our love for him, we will obey him and fulfill his plan and purpose. Now, uh, I made it clear that this government is the kingdom of, of God, that the kingdom is not a place, but it is the rule or the reign, or if you like, the government of God. So, in this prophecy, he will reign on David's throne. He will be a king in the line of David, which, of course, Jesus was. Uh, he will reign over the kingdom, not just the kingdom of Israel here on earth like David did, but he will reign over God's heavenly and eternal kingdom. Now, how will he do this? Well, he establishes and upholds it with justice and righteousness. Now, let's see what that means. His kingdom, his government, his rule, his reign could only be established on earth through justice. What was the cross all about? Justice. Sin had to be punished. And God's just and holy righteous judgment upon sin is that it was worthy of death. All sinners deserved death. Separation from God, that's what death really means. But, of course, in his love for us, God does not want us to be separated eternally from him. So he sent his son, which is what this prophecy is all about, in order to completely identify with us in our humanity, take all our sin and failure and fear, doubt, inadequacy, sickness, and every other negative thing upon himself. He paid the punishment for our sins so that the justice of God could be seen to be outworked. That God did not just shrug his shoulders and say, oh, well, sin doesn't matter, I'll forgive them. It matters so deeply because it separates and cuts people off from God that God's just judgment upon sin had to be executed. The amazing thing is that in his wonderful love for us, God doesn't punish us, he punished his son. He sent his son to actually take that punishment, to bear the brunt of that justice for himself. So it is established in justice. But the kingdom is also established in righteousness because that act of what Jesus did on the cross brought us into a right relationship with God now that all our sins are forgiven. So It was established in justice and righteousness, so Jesus lived a just and righteous life. He lived a holy life. He lived in perfect obedience to the Father. Very, very important, because if he'd sinned once, just once, he would have been like Adam, and there could have been no salvation for any of us. So he lived that sinless life. He bore all our sin. He he suffered the punishment that our sins deserved. He bore the brunt of God's justice on our behalf so that the kingdom could be established in justice and righteousness. Uh, 
But of course, what the scripture says here, that it was not only established in justice and righteousness, but it is upheld in justice and righteousness. Now, what does that mean? It means that if we live now as part of God's kingdom, we live in justice and unrighteousness. God wants, first of all, people that are justified, which means made totally acceptable in his sight, made righteous. But he wants a people walking in righteousness, living in unity with him, demonstrating in their lives that they are at one with God so that his life can flow through their lives. So the justice of God and the righteousness of God are now to be evidenced in our lives just as those things were evidenced in the life of Jesus. So um, Peter says, whoever claims to live in him, whoever claims to, to live in Christ, to be one with him, must walk as Jesus did. And Jesus himself said, anyone who believes in me will do the same things that I have been doing. And greater things still will he do because I go to the Father. So you see, God has come to live in us by the power of the Holy Spirit to make it possible for us now to live in the righteousness and the justice of God with his life, his love, his power, his presence radiating in our lives, pouring out of us. And then we've got this um, phrase that this will happen from this time on and forever. This is how God's purposes are going to be outworked on the world. So God hates injustice and he hates unrighteousness. It says in the epistle to Hebrews that the anointing of the oil of joy was upon Jesus. Why? Because he loved righteousness and hated wickedness. In other words, he lived the kingdom life here on earth. And then we have this final phrase, which I said at the beginning of the week, I, I really love. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Now, of course, that was written 700 years before the events of the cross and the resurrection. Uh, now, we look back nearly 2,000 years and say, well, the zeal of the Lord has accomplished this. God is very zealous for his kingdom. You know, everything that goes on in the life of the church, of any church anywhere, should focus on the kingdom. I, I think it's absolutely tragic that there are so many church-going people that have no real understanding or concept of what it is to live as part of God's kingdom here on earth. They don't understand what God is asking of them, requiring of them to live the life of the kingdom here on earth. And it's a wonderful life because if you live under the government of Jesus, he is able to govern through you, not just through your life, but all around you. You can spread his government, his rule, his reign, his kingdom. That, uh, what does it mean to govern? Things are brought into subjection, brought under your authority. Well, God's purpose is to bring everything in creation under the authority, under the uh, administration, if you like, the government of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we are part of that whole process. But why? Uh, why does the increase of his government know no end? Because he wants to work through those who already belong to his kingdom to extend the kingdom so that that kingdom can uh, become a reality in the lives of more and more and more people. And so just as Jesus overcame sin and sickness and all the works of the devil when he died on the cross. So, because he governs in our lives, he can express that government through us so we can govern over sin. We don't have to be ruled by sin now. Sin shall no longer be your master, Paul says. But we can rule over sin. We can rule over sickness. We can rule over the devil. We do not have to be the devil's plaything. We do not have to let him kick us around and, and steal from us. You know, he wants to steal, kill, and destroy, doesn't he? Well, we can stand against him. We can take the shield of faith with which we're able to quench all the fiery darts of the evil one. Yes, the devil is like a roaring lion prowling around, seeing who he can devour. But if we belong to the government of the Lord Jesus Christ, we have authority over him. So so Jesus said, uh, you have uh, authority over all the power of the evil one, of the devil, and nothing shall harm you. Uh, 
You see, this is the wonderful privilege of belonging to the government of God, that he governs over you, but then he can govern in you and govern through you, and you can govern over your circumstances. You don't have to let your circumstances govern you. These two verses, really, that we've looked at so closely this week make clear God's plan for redemption. But Colin, I was very interested to hear what you said about this lack of emphasis we have today on God's kingdom. It's almost as if the church has become skewed a little bit. Well, the, I mean, we're speaking generally now. Mm. All, right? all generalizations are dangerous because they're not true everywhere. Mm. But uh, generally speaking, the church has fallen into a grave error in trying to woo the world uh, instead of, uh, you know, you know it, it's, it, it's tried to be world friendly. And the result is that you have a very worldly church in many places now. And a worldly church can never affect the world because it has been affected by the world. And uh, if we're called to establish God's government in the world, that will only come by standing against worldliness. Um, John makes that, that very clear that we're, we're not to love the world, meaning we're not to love worldliness, we're not to love what the world stands for um, because, as Jesus said at his trial, my kingdom is not of this world. So uh, we have got to stand against all those pressures of worldliness so that we can really uh, be faithful to God. John writes this, Do not love the world or anything in the world, for if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Grave warning there. You've been listening to Faith for Today, presented by Julia Fisher. This program is sponsored by Kingdom Faith. For further information, visit our website, kingdomfaith.com. 